All right, welcome back, gentlemen. I'm not being sexist, YouTube tells me 100% of my viewer base is males. So it's informed. Anyway, anyway unit three of AP Chem. Let's, uh, let's have ourselves a look here. So, again, your reminder to go get your reference table so you understand what I'm talking about. Let's start with the first topic. Uh, intermolecular forces, always abbreviated as IMFs. Inter, inter meaning between two objects, molecular forces, meaning the forces that uh, constitute interactions between two molecules or two atoms or two species. So there are many types of IMFs, and we're going to get into all of them right now, okay? So uh, the first one is called London Dispersion Forces, commonly abbreviated as LDF. London Dispersion Forces are the most common, um, the most basic, and the hardest to understand. So let's, let's get into this. London Dispersion Forces, again. They're a type of intermolecular force, so they occur between two molecules, or two, two atoms, two species. Let's say this, uh, this oval is one molecule, and this oval is another, okay? In a molecule, you have electrons, right? And in a molecule, you have multiple different atoms bound together, so you have multiple different sources of electrons, okay? And as we saw when we discussed electronegativity, electrons can move. You know, electrons are not bound in place. They can move to a small degree, okay? So, at any given moment, the electrons in a molecule are, generally speaking, evenly distributed, okay? However, um... The electrons at any given moment can be anywhere, okay? Quantum mechanics is a bit beyond the scope of AP chemistry. The gist of the concept is that since electrons are subatomic particle, they can exist anywhere within a certain field at any given point in time. Like one second is over here, the next second is over there, and it can be anywhere it likes, pretty much. So, at any given moment, you might see them evenly dispersed out, or you might see, by chance, all of them collected on one side of the atom, one side of the molecule, okay? And when that happens, this side of the molecule gains a partial negative, and since this side has no electrons, this side of the molecule gains a partial positive, okay? So. If one side of the molecule is a partial positive, one side of the molecule is a partial negative, if you remember, you know, magnets, ap opposites attract, if we've got a molecule that has a partial positive charge here, it's going to attract the electrons of this molecule to come here and gain a partial negative charge so that these two poles of a magnet can meet with each other. And since this positive end of the molecule is inducing a negative partial charge on this molecule, then the other side also gains a partial positive charge. And the same principle can be seen if we add more molecules. We've got partial negative charge here, the partial negative charge. The north pole wants to find a south pole. Okay, so the minus charge wants to find a partial positive charge. So if you remember, Coulomb's law, if we have two negative charges, they repel one another, okay? So as this molecule is starting out, it's got all the electrons evenly dispersed throughout the species. And since electrons repel, the electrons here are going to repel these electrons to the other side. They're going to repel the electrons to the other side. And therefore, it creates the partial positive charge on this side and the partial negative on this side. So that's London dispersion forces. They can happen with any molecule. They can happen with every molecule, okay? Every molecule has electrons, therefore every molecule can participate in London dispersion forces, okay? 
So London dispersion forces, as I've demonstrated to you, they're attractive forces. One side is negative, the other side's positive, they attract. One side's positive, the other side's negative, they attract. So it keeps the solution or solid or gas or whatever this is, it keeps it nice and uh, compact, okay? Now, let's talk about the factors that affect London dispersion forces. And the primary one, is how many electrons do you have, okay? Something with more electrons will be, uh, this is the term they want you to use on the AP exam, something with more electrons has a more polarizable electron shell, okay? And if it has a more polarizable electron shell, it can have a larger partial charge on each side. If it has a larger partial charge on each side, it can induce larger partial charges on other molecules, and so on and so forth. So to give you an example, a uh, molecule such as hexane, uh, C6H14, I think, yeah, C6H14, it's a pretty large molecule. It's got six carbons, 14 hydrogens, and meanwhile you might have a much smaller smaller uh, molecule like C2H6, which is ethane. So this guy is going to have the more powerful London dispersion forces because he's bigger. And if he's bigger, he has more mole he has more atoms. If he has more atoms, those atoms bring more electrons. However, if I gave you C6H14 uh, and I gave you like C3, CL, uh, what would that be? Six, eight, CL8. This guy would have much stronger London dispersion forces. Why? Because CL is a much larger molecule, a much larger atom. CL brings many, many more electrons than hydrogen and three more carbons, okay? So moving on to the next type of IMF, we have dipole-dipole, commonly abbreviated as D-D. -D. Okay, so we talked about dipoles in the previous video. A dipole is when you have a molecule such as NH3 that looks like this. that has polar bonds, one, and has a polar geometry, two, meaning that the geometry of the molecule does not cancel out its polarity, okay? So when you have a polar molecule, if you don't know how to uh, judge whether a molecule is polar or not, I suggest you watch the last, like, 20, 25-ish minutes of our previous Unit 2 video. We go into depth on that. So it's a polar molecule, okay? You also need to know how to understand in a polar molecule which side is the negative side, which side is the positive side, okay? The elect more electronegative atom is the negative side. So in this case, if you look at your periodic table, um, remember, hydrogen and carbon have the same electronegativity. N, nitrogen, is further to the right than carbon, Therefore, nitrogen is more electronegative than carbon, so this guy takes on the negative charge, and these three take on the partial positive. This partial negative is going to be attracted to this partial positive, and this partial positive down here will go out and seek another partial negative, you know? We're, we're building magnets, and we're trying to find north and south poles to unite those magnets. The only difference here is these are permanent magnets. These are permanent dipoles, okay? These can fluctuate. Like I said before, at any given point, these electrons could suddenly decide that they want to be over here now. And now the whole chain breaks, okay? These are temporary. This arrangement happens by chance. This arrangement, these are permanent magnets, okay? 
n will always have the partial negative, and the h's will always have the partial positive. So this is a much stronger form of intermolecular forces. Okay. Now, you can combine these two into our next uh, IMF, which is called, uh, let me pump my marker, dipole induced dipole. Okay, so let me pick another polar molecule, H2O. Okay, pause the video now. Tell me which side has the partial positive, which side is the partial negative. Oxygen, partial negative. Hydrogen, partial positive. Okay, so when, a, when an H2O comes into contact with some other molecule that's that's not a dipole, okay, this, mole this uh, other molecule has to be nonpolar, okay, because if it were polar, then we would have a dipole-dipole interaction right here, and this partial negative would correspond to this partial positive. However, this is not a dipole. This is a nonpolar molecule. So, like we said before, Coulomb's law. Think of Coulomb's law. Negative charges repel, negative and positive attract, okay? So this guy has its electrons scattered all over the place, but since there's a negative charge on the oxygen, that negative charge repels all of the electrons to one side, and thus a positive charge, a partial positive charge, is created on this side of the molecule. So this permanent dipole is inducing a dipole on this nonpolar molecule. This is still a temporary dipole, because at any point in time, quantum physics could say, no, the electron wants to be over here now, we're over there now, and you get the point. Another type of dipole-dipole interaction, this is the most powerful type of dipole-dipole interaction, is ion-dipole interaction. Ion dipole interaction is when you have a dipole, a polar molecule, let's stick with H2O, partial negative, partial positive, and you have that interacting with an ion. Okay, what's a good ion? Na plus, the sodium ion. Partial negative finds its positive. Magnets opposite attract. Okay, the reason this is considerably more powerful than all the rest is Notice how I've been using this symbol to designate a partial charge, okay? Notice how the sodium ion does not have that symbol. This is not a partial charge, this is a full positive charge, right? Because it is missing a whole electron, okay? It is a whole electron more positive. Now, moving on from there, we have the most powerful type of intermolecular force, which is called hydrogen bonding, abbreviated as H bonding. Okay? So hydrogen bonding can occur when you have an H in one of the species, and one of these three atoms in the other species. Remember the acronym FON, fluorine, oxygen, nitrogen, FON, okay? Let me show, give you an example of H bonding. So if I have a solution of water, you know, H2O, H bonding would occur here because if I take another H2O molecule, I would have H bonding between this H and this oxygen, and this H and this oxygen and the chain continues with a bunch more hydrogen uh, and oxygen atoms in the rest of the water molecules. If I had to rank them in uh, power, London dispersion forces is the weakest. Next is dipole-induced dipole. Next is dipole-dipole. Next is ion-dipole. Next is H-bonding. Okay? So, we're going to take a look at this in the phases of matter, okay? 
if I have a liquid, okay, if I, let's say my liquid is H2O, all right? H2O, like I said before, all molecules have electrons, therefore all molecules experience London dispersion forces. So water has LDF, check. Water is a polar molecule. It has dipole-dipole, check. And water has oxygens and hydrogens present. It has H bonding, check, okay? So that's a very powerful arsenal of intermolecular forces that it has. Okay, what does that mean? It means that the water molecules are very tightly bound to each other. They don't want to separate, okay? So what do we call separating molecules? It's when we turn a liquid to a gas. That's how we separate molecules, okay? If I wanted to turn liquid water into gaseous water, water vapor, and we, we use that with subscripts, let me just show you that. If I turn wanted to turn water, a liquid, into H2O gas, this is proper notation. I, I, I'd implore you to uh, memorize how you can represent the stages of matter in your chemical equations. You know, you have solid, and you have aqueous. We're gonna get into what aqueous means in later units. Anyway, turning it from liquid to a gas would require an immense amount of energy because the hydrogen molecules are very tightly bound together, right? And like I said before, to break bonds, it takes a lot of energy. So, if you're given a species on the AP exam, and it has very strong IMFs, it has a good list of IMFs, it's going to require a lot of energy to boil. It's going to require a lot of energy to turn into a gas, because doing that would involve breaking all of those intermolecular bonds. Now, the solid phase is kind of independent of everything else. Like, they ask a couple multiple choice questions on this, and they really want you to learn a lot of useless information for these solids questions. I'm gonna teach you a trick you can just learn in two minutes and I don't have to spend 20 minutes on this topic. So, solids. There are four types of solids. There are four types of solids. There is network covalent solids. There is metallic solids. There is ionic solids, and there is molecular solids. Okay? Now, instead of teaching you what all these words mean, that would take a very long time, I'm just going to give you examples of each type of solid. A network covalent solid is something like a diamond. A metallic solid is something like steel. An ionic solid is something like the salt on your table in the kitchen. And a molecular solid is ice. Okay? That's still. I, I'm, there's a reason I'm teaching chemistry and not English. Okay. So, when these come up on the AP exam, they're going to ask you questions like, which one conducts electricity? Which one has a higher melting point? Which one is harder? Which one's more brittle? Okay? And you'd need to learn a lot of really... It doesn't apply anywhere else sort of chemistry. So, instead of that, when you're asked which one has the highest melting point, hey, ice melts pretty easily. Diamonds... They, they take a lot of energy to melt. I think it's the network covalent one that has the highest melting point. You see what I mean here? Like, this is so much easier. They're gonna ask you a question like, which one conducts electricity? Hmm, I think steel conducts electricity. Uh, another type of question they would ask is, which one conducts electricity in solution? Okay. Ionic solids conduct electricity in solution. And you might be asked to explain that. 
Ionic solids, NaCl, this is an example of ionic solid. Since it's an ionic solid, it dissociates in water into Na plus Cl minus. Okay, and the reason that it is conductive in solution, it's conductive in water, is because these are now charges, okay? Mobile charges conduct electricity. In a metallic bond, you have a sea of electrons that are free to move wherever they like. Ions, or charges that are free to move, conduct electricity, okay? So in the solid state, an ionic solid is not conductive because the solid locks in the charges where they are, but in solution, the charges, the ions, are free to move wherever they like. So that can conduct electricity. Okay. So the last topic with uh, solids, liquids, and gases is this is very common type of FRQ. You will be asked to get, draw, like with your pencil, draw a particulate representation of the species, okay? So what that means, I'm going to give you some examples, all right? So if you were asked to draw NACL, or I, I drew NACL for you in a previous video. What haven't I drawn for you? I haven't drawn a network covalent for you. So a network covalent, if they asked you to draw that, first of all, they would give you like a beaker or some box. Since it's a solid, okay, it should not occupy only the bottom of the flask, okay? It has the power to stand up on its own. If it occupies only the bottom of the flask, they assume you're drawing a liquid because a liquid does that, okay? So you need to have you know, some free space here and some free space here to demonstrate to the reader that you're drawing a solid that has structural integrity and can stand on its own. Okay, little, little nit nit nitpicky thing. The readers are very strict with your drawings. Okay. So a network covalent solid, um, a network covalent solid is all of the different molecules are bounded together by a network of bonds. So in the case of diamond, uh, those would be carbon atoms bonded to, car bonded to carbon atoms, bonded to carbon atoms, and so on and so forth. And everything's connected in sort of a web. And they would give you directions like feature at least this many atoms in your uh, designation. Uh, if they asked you to draw a liquid, like I said before, you would need to draw it with individual particles on, like, the bottom of the flask. I like to draw the little waves on top to just emphasize I'm drawing a liquid. Okay, well, in liquid, uh, they would often give you an ionic solid and show that dissolved in water. So let me raise this bar a bit. Okay, and you would be asked to draw what uh, NaCl or something like that looks like when you dissolve it in water. So, as we already know, NaCl dissolved in water becomes Na plus Cl minus. Okay, but you would also, since it's dissolved in water, you would also need to draw the water molecules, because those are an essential part of the representation. And you also need to draw them in a specific way in accordance with IMFs and the dipole-dipole interaction, excuse me, dipole-ion interactions. So if I drew the Na plus ion and I drew a circle around it, I would draw the H2O molecules with the oxygen oriented towards it to accommodate for ion-dipole interactions. And I would draw the Cl minus ion with the hydrogens directed towards it. Because the hydrogens are the partial positive, they need to communicate with the minus ion. And you would draw it like that. O goes to the positive ion, the H's go to the negative ion. Okay? And in a gas, you were to draw a gas. You would not 
you know, you obviously wouldn't draw this. You would draw the molecules all over the container, for one. And in, um, if they tell you it's an ideal gas, we're going to cover ideal gases in just a moment, they tell you an ideal gas, then you can draw them any which way you want, just draw the particles all willy-nilly. It's important, you need to draw them all willy-nilly, because that's what a gas looks like. If it's not an ideal gas, you need to account for intermolecular forces. Okay? So if they give you water, H2O, and they tell you it's not an ideal gas, then you need to draw the H's pointing to the O's and the O's pointing to the H's. If they give you water and they tell you it's an ideal gas, then you can draw them any which way you like all over the flask. Okay, so I'll, I'll give you the representation of what it looks like as a non-ideal gas. You're not required to draw in the partial charge signs, but if you really want to impress your reader, they're a good idea. Like, if you don't draw them, obviously they can't take off points for that, but, you know, it's, it's your business. Anyway, ideal gas law is what we can cover now. Ideal gas law, okay? It's pretty much just an equation. It's an equation that's on your reference table. PV equals nRT. Let's get into what that means, okay? P, that's your pressure. The pressure in your flask, your containment vessel, okay? Because in all the problems, you're going to be given a gas in a containment vessel, not like in a room like this. So the pressure in your containment vessel. V, the volume of your containment vessel. N, lowercase n the moles of gas that you have. Moles of gas. R. R is a constant. R is the gas law constant that you can find on your reference table. The gas constant. Okay. There are multiple gas constants. Which one do you use? One of the gas constants is in units of atmospheres. One of the gas constants is in units of tor. One of the gas constants is in units of millimeters of mercury, I believe. Okay, so now that you know that the different gas constants are in different units, you need to pay attention. What units of pressure do I have? What units of volume do I have? If you know the units of pressure and volume, those units will correspond to the units on your gas law constant. And that will tell you which gas law constant you need to use. And of course, T equals temperature. In degrees Kelvin. In degrees Kelvin. The AP writers are evil. They will always give you it in degrees Celsius every time and they want you to remember to convert from Celsius to Kelvin. The way you do that is Celsius plus 273 equals Kelvin. It's that simple. Okay, it's a simple step that they're going to trick you with. Remember to convert to Kelvin. Okay. So, the, the problems you get with ideal gas law, they're really not that hard. They're just, okay, Here's three of the values, find the fourth. Just plug into the equation and find the missing value. Okay. But then, when you get to the FRQs, they start to ask more advanced types of questions. Okay. And for that, we, uh, we use another equation. Equation for what we call the partial pressure. The partial pressure, uh, it's designated as P sub A, where A is your species, let's say A equals H2O, 
Let's find the partial pressure of H2O. That's how you would write that with H2O as a subscript. The partial pressure of H2O equals the moles of H2O divided by the total moles of gas. And this division, this ratio right here, we call X our mole fraction. Okay? Call it the mole fraction because it is the fraction of moles that are H2O out of all the moles of gas we have. So you take X, your mole fraction, and multiply it by the total pressure to get your partial pressure of H2O. And as you might imagine, if you calculate the partial pressures of all of the species in the gas, in the gas tank, if you calculate all the partial pressures, they all add to the total pressure. Okay? So, um, very, very common type of problem. Um, they would give you all of your units, like they'd say the total pressure is one atmosphere, total volume is one liter, the temperature is like 25 degrees C. Convert to Kelvin. 2025 plus 273 becomes 298. Ooh, 298 degrees Kelvin. So they give you your three values that you need. And then they say, okay. Uh, what would they tell you? They would tell you that eight grams of H2O were in the reaction vessel, referencing to the vessel that your gas is in. Eight grams of H2O in the reaction vessel. Along with See, what reacts with water? Um, ethylene. C2H4. Along with, let's call this 24 grams of C2H4. Find the partial pressure of water. Okay? I'm looking for partial pressure H2O. Question mark. So the way you do that is you convert grams of water to moles of water, you convert grams of ethylene to moles of ethylene, you add those two numbers together, those are your total moles of gas, okay? Now you have your moles of H2O, so you divide those two values, that's your mole fraction. So the mole fraction of H2O times the total pressure, one atmosphere, gives you the partial pressure of H2O. And the total pressure minus the partial pressure of H2O is the partial pressure of ethylene. That's ideal gas law FRQ right there. In the ideal gas law equation, let me bring that back for you a minute now. PV equals NRT. All right, we have a T value. All right, T represents temperature, like I said. So what exa exactly does temperature do in a gas? Well, as we raise the temperature, the average velocity of the particles in the gas increases. So if you guys don't know, in a gas, the particles are always constantly in motion. Okay, a gas is not static. The, the particles are always in motion, always bouncing off other particles, always bouncing off the walls of the container. And that's actually what pressure is, okay? All of you guys, when you think pressure, you think of a gas pushing on the walls of a container trying to come out, okay? At a molecular level, what pressure is, is the molecules of a gas with their velocity, with their speed, ramming into the walls of the container, okay? So if you increase your temperature, if you increase the speed of the particles, because temperature 
directly affects the speed of particles. If you increase the speed of the particles, they hit the walls of the container with more force. So as you increase temperature, therefore you increase the pressure. And you can see that in the equation. As you, what you do to one side of the equation, you do to the other side of the equation. As you increase temperature, you increase pressure, assuming volume stays the same. Okay? As you increase the number of moles of gas, you increase pressure. As you increase the number of particles hitting the wall of the container, you increase pressure. As you increase volume, you know, there's now more container, you decrease pressure because pressure is sort of the average amount and kinetic energy of the collisions that occur to the wall of the container. So if there's more container to hit, then each section of the container will receive less punches, less hits. So the pressure decreases as volume increases. Okay? And you kind of got to use your common sense with this. Okay? As I increase volume, increasing volume does not increase my temperature. I'm not adding any heat. Increasing my volume doesn't increase the amount of moles of gas I have. I'm not adding any more gas. So if I increase volume, that means pressure has to decrease. Okay. So let's get back to this idea of how temperature affects the speed and velocity of the particles. All right. On the AP chemistry exam, you're going to see a graph. You're going to see a graph and that graph is called the Maxwell Boltzmann distribution. You don't need to memorize that name, okay? So, on the y-axis, we're going to plot speed of particles. And on the y-axis, you're going to plot number of particles at, the, at that speed, at that speed, okay? And the Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution looks a little something like this. It looks like a bell curve. Okay? So, that means that all of the particles are at varying speeds. Some particles are moving a lot faster than others. Some particles are moving a lot slower than others. But most of the particles hang right in between. Okay? Most of the particles have some average speed. Have some average speed, okay? Now, there are two main characteristics of the Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution that you need to understand. Okay? The shape and position of this graph changes with a change in temperature, and you need to understand how it changes with a change in temperature. So if I decrease temperature, that it would make sense that the average speed of the particles would decrease. It would make sense for this whole thing to move to the left, okay? But here's what it does. It does move to the left, but it constricts itself like that, okay? So the average speed of the particles does indeed move to the left, but the graph is now constricted and it's taller, okay? So what does that mean? It's taller means that the number of particles at the average is much higher. And it's constricted, meaning there's a lower range of speeds that the particles occupy, okay? So as you increase temperature, the average speed increases and the range of possible speeds also increases, okay? It makes sense, right? Because the minimum speed is zero, and the maximum speed of any given particle in the distribution is proportional to the amount of temperature you apply, okay? So that grows much faster than the average, all right? And what happens when you constrict a range of values if you constrict a range of values, there are fewer values for all the particles to occupy. So, more particles occupy the same value, right? 
if there are more values to occupy, then fewer particles occupy each value. So the graph gets flatter as it gets longer. Okay? So the idea of the Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution and all of ideal gas law in and of itself depends on one assumption. That the collisions between particles are elastic. Okay, if you took physics, you know what an elastic collision is, but I'm going to explain it for those of you who haven't. An elastic collision is, let's say this is a gas particle, and this is a gas particle. When the two collide, all of the energy that they had prior is transferred in the collision. Okay, an elastic collision means that if this guy has a kinetic energy of 2, and this guy has a kinetic energy of 4, their total kinetic energy is 6. Okay, if their total kin energy, kinetic energy is 6, then these two particles that result that you know, after the collision, they must also have a total kinetic energy of six. You know, one might have three, the other might have three, but total kinetic energy is conserved completely. Now, by contrast, you could have a, an inelastic collision, which is everything you experience in your everyday life, okay? In an inelastic condition, co collision, some of the kinetic energy is converted to heat, or is lost to friction, or is lost in some other way, like you collide into a building. Like the building's not going to move, and you're not going to move. You're just going to stay there with a broken nose, okay? You transferred your kinetic energy into vibrations, maybe into the building, most likely vibrations into you, and you stopped with the friction of your feet on the floor, okay? So your kinetic energy when you collide into a building reduces to pretty much zero. That's an example of an inelastic. In ideal gas law, we're assuming that the collisions between particles are elastic. And for the most part, they are, okay? For the most part, there's no friction in the gaseous space. However, also assessed on the AP exam would be questions like, how could this differ from ideal gas law? Okay, if ideal gas law states that collisions are elastic, what could cause the elision, the collisions to become inelastic? So, deviations from ideal gas law. Okay, what could cause the collisions to become inelastic? Two ways. Two ways. Way number one. The molecules are polar. I'm going to say highly polar. Highly polar. Okay. Because if the molecules are highly polar, then, you know, think of it like two magnets. When two magnets collide, they, they don't want to separate. They don't want to come back apart, okay? In an elastic collision, the molecules collide and, you know, they spring back outwards. Total kinetic energy is conserved. But in polar molecules, they collide and then they're stuck, like magnets some of the kinetic energy is used up, some of the kinetic energy is lost to break the magnets back apart. So both of them are now, now have less kinetic energy, they're moving slower now, because they had to use some of that energy to break the magnet. And two, at extremely low temperatures, relatively low temperatures, I should say, because it's dependent on the molecule. Very low temperatures. 
when you take a gas and you put it under very low temperatures, when you take a gas and like, let's say, water vapor, steam, steam condenses into water when you lower its temperature. Steam starts to turn into a liquid when you lower its temperature, okay? So, how do we go from a gas to a liquid? We introduce IMFs. When we go from a liquid to a gas, we break IMFs, okay? So, at very low temperatures, uh, because of the idea I have behind me, at very low temperatures, the molecules are moving very slowly, okay? And if they're moving very slowly, they don't have enough kinetic energy to escape the attractions, the London dispersion forces, whatever type of attraction you might have between the molecules, okay? So, either the molecules are highly polar, or you subject a non-polar gas to very low temperatures, and in that case, the London dispersion force forces have enough time to sort of settle in with the molecules, and they start to form London dispersion forces bonds, London dispersion force attractions, and they condense into a liquid. Next up, solutions. Solutions, okay? In a solution, we have a solute and we have a solvent. The solute is what is being dissolved, the solvent is what is doing the dissolving, okay? Water is a very common solvent, and it's pretty much the only solvent you're going to see in AP chemistry. In solution, we introduce this concept of concentration, okay? How concentrated is the solute in the solution, okay? Concentration is synonymous with the term molarity. Molarity, okay? The formula for molarity is moles of solute divided by liters of solution, okay? If you're given a solution in milliliters, you need to convert to liters. Liters of solution, that equals molarity and it's in the units, moles per liter, as you might expect. Okay. So, very common type of question. I have 24 grams of NaOH. Okay, and I dissolve it, I put it in one liter of water. What is the concentration of OH minus hydroxide ion? Okay, if you memorized your list of ions at the beginning, you'd know this is an ionic compound because it's Na plus and another ion. Okay? Anyway, so, pretty simple. 24 grams of NaOH. We need to convert that to moles. So we find the molar mass of Na, the molar mass of oxygen, the molar mass of hydrogen. We add those molar masses together. Once we add those three molar masses together, that gives us the molar mass of the entire molecule of NaOH. So that, now that we have the molar mass of NaOH, it's grams divided by molar mass to give us moles of NaOH. So when I add up those, I get the molar mass 40.007 grams per mole. Okay, I got 24 grams of NaOH. I multiply that by my uh, Ratio, I put one mole on top because that's what I want. I put 40.007 grams on the bottom. Grams cancel. Um, 
I get somewhere in the domain of 1.8 moles. I don't know what I was smoking when I got that answer, but just know that's completely wrong. Somewhere around there. Okay, I've got 1.8 moles of NaOH. Now that I'm in a unit of particles, now that I'm in a unit of particles, I can say the particles of NaOH dissociate into particles of Na plus and OH minus, okay? Grams of NaOH do not dissociate into grams of Na plus and OH minus. Particles dissociate into particles, okay? So if I've got 1.8, uh, I'm going to say particles, 1.8 particles of NaOH, those become 1.8 particles of Na plus and 1.8 particles of OH minus. So I have 1.8 moles of Na plus, okay, because it dissociates in water. So I also have 1.8 moles of OH minus. And it asks, what is the concentration of OH minus? 1.8 moles OH minus divided by one liter of solution is 1.8 moles per liter. Commonly abbreviated as capital M. Capital M represents molarity. Lowercase m represents mass. Lowercase n represents moles or mol. I touched on this a bit before but uh, the most common type of drawing you're going to need to do on the AP exam is the one of solutions. The one where you draw the solids and all of that that I covered before, that's a more rare FRQ, but in the majority of AP exams they will ask you to draw a particle representation of a solution. How about, let's keep using this as an example. They would give you your flask, and in every case where they give you draw a liquid or a solution, I would always recommend drawing the little wavy thing at the top just to really communicate to the reader that you're drawing a liquid. Okay? And I referenced before when I showed you the subscripts for, you know, representing liquid and gas phases of species. And I told you about the aqueous phase. Aqueous phase is ions. So Na plus would be in the aqueous phase because Na plus can only exist in solution. You can't have an Na plus ion just floating around in space. It doesn't exist like that. Na plus only exists in solution. If you put NaOH in water and it dissociates into Na plus OH minus, and you boil all the water, you're not going to be left with Na+, you're going to be left with NaOH, because it reunites, the Na plus ion reunites with the OH minus ion when the water is removed. So this aqueous designation means it's in water, it's in solution. It's not technically a state of matter, but it's important when writing chemical reactions. Anywho, you were asked to draw this particular representation you would draw your Na plus ion, you would draw your oxygens associated with it and the water molecules that it's dissolved in, and if, if you really try hard you would draw the oxygens also associated with the hydrogen of another water molecule, and in the case of the OH minus ion, the minus is on the oxygen and you would draw the hydrogens of the water associated with that section. Okay? If, for example, um, I were to do this, that's points off. That's a significant amount of points off. Make sure you understand how the ion-dipole uh, interaction works and how you need to draw your water molecules 
to follow the rules of solution, okay? And also don't draw really big, because in the directions they're going to tell you include at least 10 water molecules, include at least uh, 4 ions. And obviously if you draw 4 Na plus ions, the whole FRQ is wrong. Like that's a big problem if you draw only 4 Na plus ions. The particulate representation should be representative of the entire solution, okay? So when you were asked to draw four ions, you draw two Na plus and two OH minus because your uh, solute dissociates into one of each. Okay, so that brings us to our next topic. Once you have something dissolved in a solution or once you have two liquids mixed together, how do you separate them? We've got two processes in chemistry that you're gonna to need to know. Process one, a process probably many of you have heard of, distillation. Probably many of you have heard of, but have no idea what it is. Process number two, chromatography. What is distillation? Okay. Distillation is separating um, solutions or separating liquids or boiling off all the water, basically separating things by boiling point, okay? So if I have ethanol, C, C, H, 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 O, H, this is ethanol right here, okay? You know what? Pause the video right now. You tell me why this is soluble in water, why it's very soluble in water, okay? Based off of IMFs, based off of IMFs, tell me why this is very soluble in water. The answer is, first, it's got pretty good London dispersion forces, it's a pretty large molecule, it's got an oxygen atom, which is good, it's got two carbons and it's, it's good size. Secondly, it has a CO bond and an OH bond, making it a dipole. This, the oxygen, taking on the partial negative. Third of all, it has OH. Remember Fawn? This can participate in hydrogen bonding. And since it has both the O and the H, it can participate in two hydrogen bonding. So it's very very attracted to the water molecule, so it can dissolve in water. Solubility, we're going to get the solubility uh, later in the video, but this is a little taste of solubility. Okay? Now, because um, ethanol, which is this molecule in water, have two different boiling points, because they're two different molecules, we can use distillation. Okay, what distillation is, is I don't know the exact boiling point of ethanol. Let's say it boils at 60 degrees Celsius. I'm not quite sure what it boils at. And I, I hope we all know that water boils at 100 degrees Celsius. Okay, so if ethanol boils at 60 degrees Celsius, I take our solution of ethanol and water and I heat it to 70 degrees Celsius therefore all of the ethanol evaporates out. It's a sealed container, so all of the gas that evaporates is collected in its own sealed container. And if I wanted just the water, then I don't care about the gas. But if I wanted just the ethanol, then I would take that sealed container that contains the gaseous ethanol, and I would cool it down so that all of the gas would then condense back into ethanol. And that's how we separate things by distillation. Chromatography separates molecules uh, in solution based off of polarity, okay? So uh, let me choose, let's say ethanol this time is our solvent because at room temperature ethanol is a liquid. Ethanol is our solvent and let's say I dissolved hmm, ethane in it. Methane. Let's call it methane. C, H, 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 H. Okay, let's say I dissolved methane in that. 
Methane, as both is has a nonpolar geometry and it even has nonpolar bonds, so it's nonpolar. Okay? If I dissolve this in ethanol, then I could use chromatography to separate them based off of polarity. Chromatography is sort of a special type of paper, okay? The paper is generally referred to as, uh, let me get it for you here. They use this word on the AP exam, and I don't know why, because it's so confusing. Um, they call the paper in chromatography a stationary phase. Okay, the paper in chromatography is called the stationary phase. Stationary phase. Okay, so the stationary phase, the paper, can either be polar or nonpolar. And we all know what happens when you stick a piece of paper in a solution. The solution starts climbing up, right? If you haven't done that, do an experiment in your bathroom. Take your toilet paper, fill the sink up with water, put the toilet paper in the sink, and you see the water start to climb up the toilet paper slowly. If the paper we put in is polar, then it will attract the polar molecules. All the polar mo molecules will be attracted to the paper, and because they're attracted to the paper, they won't be able to travel very far up, okay? The molecules are a magnet, the paper is a magnet. They are attracted to the paper, but now that they're attracted to the paper, they can't move, okay? But if the sheet is polar and you've got nonpolar molecules, the nonpolar molecules are able to glide right up the paper, and the nonpolar molecules are going to be up here, and the polar molecules are going to be down here, okay? The liquid, the actual stuff that's climbing up the paper, is called the mobile phase. There's two words that you need to know what they mean. All right. So if the stationary phase is nonpolar, then the exact opposite is true. The nonpolar stuff will be stuck down here, and the polar stuff will collect at the top. Now, like I hinted before, let's get into solubility. Solubility. There's one basic idea that all of solubility is based around. You can't use this in your FRQ explanations, it's just a basic idea that's gonna serve as an introduction. It's the idea of like dissolves like. Like dissolves like. Okay, what do I mean by that? Things that have s similar IMFs dissolve things that have the same IMFs, okay? If you have an, uh, a solvent that has only London dispersion forces between its molecules, then it can only dissolve stuff that, ha that only experiences London dispersion forces. In other words, nonpolar solvents only dissolve nonpolar molecules, okay? And if the FRQ asked you why, you would say, because the London dispersion forces are very strong, and those London dispersion forces would be able to form solid attractions, solid attractive forces between the solute and the solvent. Okay? Some, a nonpolar molecule is not soluble in a polar solvent. Okay? Polar, a nonpolar molecule, what's a nonpolar molecule that you're accustomed with in your everyday life? Um, air. Air, London dispersion forces can become much more powerful than dipole-dipole if the London dispersion forces happen between big enough molecules. And when I say big enough molecules, I mean molecules with large amounts of electrons. Remember that key word, polarizable electron cloud. If you don't remember me saying that, please go watch the beginning of the video when I cover LDF. It's a very important word that you need in your all your explanations that involve LDF. Items that feature H-bonding are very soluble in water or other molecules that can participate in H-bonding, okay? So obviously water is the main uh, solvent that exhibits H-bonding, 
but you can have ethanol up here because it has the OH and it can participate in H bonding. Okay? So anything that has an OH can dissolve anything else that has an OH because H bonding. All right? You're not allowed to say like dissolve like when you explain it. When you explain it, you have to say that air is not soluble in water because air only has very weak London dispersion forces, and you can say it has very weak London dispersion forces because it's only two atoms with a relatively small number of electrons. Only, I believe, eight total electrons, six valence, two core. Okay? And water exhibits very weak London dispersion forces. And it is a dipole molecule, a dipole that is incompatible with a nonpolar molecule such as water. Therefore, there are no dipole-dipole interactions. What I just said right there is a full credit, 10 out of 10 explanation for why air is not, I say air, I mean O2, oxygen bonded to oxygen, is not soluble in water. 10 out of 10 explanation for why uh, ethanol this guy right here is soluble in water, is one, you wouldn't mention LDF because water has negligible or very weak LDF. The ethanol is soluble in water because water exhibits a strong dipole, as does ethanol, and these dipole-dipole interactions effectively solvate, that's the verb, solvate, ethanol, in addition to the H bonding that is present between ethanol and water. The OH group, uh, the O on the ethanol forms H bonds to the hydrogens in water, and the oxygen in water forms H bonds to the hydrogen in ethanol. Perfect 10 out of 10 explanation. Our last topic here is light, or as I like to call it, photochemistry. So, um, again, I'm assuming you haven't taken a physics course, so you don't know exactly what light is. Light has two properties, and they are related to one another by a very simple equation. Okay? Light is a wave. Light is a wave. And it's a particle. Please bear with me. Please bear with me. Light is either a wave or a particle, and it's both a wave and a particle, okay? And there are different applications of each form of light, okay? Whether or not it's a wave or a particle, it has something called a frequency and a wavelength. So these are related by the equation, okay? So they have it as the speed of light equals wavelength times frequency. And they, instead of using F for frequency, they use V. Anywho, frequency times wavelength equals speed of light. Okay? So since the speed of light is a constant number, wavelength and frequency change with each other. As frequency increases, wavelength decreases, and vice versa. So, since you can instantly convert frequency and wavelength however way you want, you can use either. Frequency designates what type of light it is, okay? So, what you should know is that the higher the frequency, the more energy the light has, all right? Over at the highest energy, the highest frequency, is stuff like x-rays and gamma rays. I'm going to put up a picture of the electromagnetic spectrum here. The electromagnetic spectrum is basically a continuum, a line, of all of the different frequencies and what types of waves they are. Visible light is right in the middle. Okay. X-rays are at the very high energy level, high frequency. Radio waves are at the very low energy. Okay. So you're going to need to know how light and wavelengths and the light energy interacts with atoms and molecules. We're generally going to be concerned with 
all the way from visible light up to x-rays. We don't care about the other half of the spectrum right now, because those wavelengths are not active with reference to atoms. Okay? So when you look at this uh, gamma ray is the most powerful, let me give you an example. Like a gamma ray could split the nucleus of an atom. Nuclear bomb type stuff. Uh, in the middle here, you've got stuff like ultraviolet and microwaves. Uh, when an atom is hit by ultraviolet and microwaves, it starts vibrating, it starts spinning, and stuff like that. That's, it's a very rare type of question to, uh, to, for them to ask you what happens when an atom is hit by ultraviolet light. And you just have to know that it uh, like spins or vibrates or something like that. It's very rare, but in the case that it does happen, you know the answer now. The most common type of question is in the visible light spectrum, okay? Atoms abs absorb visible light in discrete values, and the word discrete means specific or finite. Okay, so if I draw, let's call it a hydrogen atom, one proton, one electron. Okay, and let me, uh, maybe you didn't realize this before, but all atoms have all the orbitals, okay? They have all of the orbitals, the orbitals are just empty. So hydrogen has all, like, the eight different orbitals that exist, but it only has an electron in the first 1s orbital. When it absorbs light, when it absorbs a wavelength of light, that electron is promoted, we call it. The electron is promoted to a higher energy level. Well, it can be promoted a lot to a much higher energy level. Okay? So, when that happens, you need to know that specific frequencies, because they correspond to specific energies of light, promote an electron by different amounts, okay? And since an electron cannot be promoted halfway between two orbitals, it has to go from one orbital to the next, it can only absorb a well-defined exact amount of light. So if promoting this electron to the fourth orbital takes a, a photon of light of, uh, let's call it frequency, 1 times 10 to the 5th, 1 times, yeah, 1 times 10 to the 5th, then if I give it 1 times 10 to the 4th, nothing happens. The light just reflects off, because the atom cannot absorb 1 times 10 to the 4th, a frequency of 1 times 10 to the 4th. It needs 1 times 10 to the 5th. In that case, the light comes in, it is absorbed, it disappears, and the electron is promoted to the outer energy level. Okay? The same also applies when the energy, when the electron is in the outer energy level and it drops down, it releases light. They're pretty much never going to give you an FRQ on this. It's only like two, it's, yeah, it's generally in the domain of two questions on the multiple choice. One of the other uh, applications of light in chemistry is something called beer lampert Law. You don't need to know it's called that. It's basically, um, since we know that some species absorb light and others don't, we can take a specialized machine, okay, a machine that emits a very specific wavelength of light. It emits a very specific wavelength of light, and on this side it's got a sensor that senses the concentration of light, okay? And we can shine that through a reaction vessel that's filled with a reaction, okay? So in that reaction, you know, you've got products A plus B forming C. Products forming, uh, reactants forming products, okay? C is your product, A plus B is your reactants, okay? So let's say that B, B absorbs this wavelength of light. If B absorbs that wavelength of light, then before the reaction starts, 
when there's a hundred percent concentration of B, no light reaches the sensor. But as the reaction progresses and the concentration of B diminishes to form C, B can't absorb the light anymore. So some light reaches the sensor, okay? And in that type of machine, we're able to understand the rate of the reaction. How fast does the reaction progress? Because we're basing it on how fast does B disappear. If B disappears, that means it worked to form C. All right, and that's based off the, the intensity of light that's being picked up by the sensor there. Okay, it's unit three, guys. Thanks so much. Enjoy life.